<laughs> well, I call that a lot of fanfare. <laughs> well done. And well, thank you very, very much. This morning, I'm not going to quote from any illustrious authors because I want to tie my subject to personal experiences. Over the last time of over 60 years, I've had the opportunity to watch thousands of persons going out in a great crusade in search of truth. They almost remind me a little of the medieval crusades in which persons in every walk of life, every degree of intelligence, set out on that great pilgrimage from Europe to Jerusalem. Many got only a short distance and gave up. Others kept on to die in the desert. Still others fought their way through the ranks of the Saracen and either died there or gradually returned to their own lands. A fraction came back. They were all seeking the holy city, the city of their faith. And in spite of every effort for centuries, Christendom was never able to recapture that city. And in a way, this reminds me of the struggle of people today in every religion, every faith, every cult, and every creed. Human beings are searching for the personal experience of reality. They are seeking to come to understand themselves, to find a reason for their own existence, to find that balm of Gilead which has been promised to them. They have come in every color, creed, race, and type, and every degree of intelligence. And yet, with it all, so very few have reached the goal that they sought. Many reached a goal which they thought was what they sought. But after a time, it proved elusive and delusionary, and the search continued. The alchemists sought to make gold and also to reform society. The hermetists studied the secrets of nature. The Greek mystics and philosophers studied the world with the most profound attention and with the greatest benevolence. Many of them came to extraordinary conclusions, but now in the 20th century, these conclusions are arranged against each other, and a new materialism, a new intellectualism has taken over, and a new pilgrimage has been declared a pilgrimage into the great economic future of a world industrial wealth. Still, the search goes on, the search for peace among nations, peace in our own hearts, peace in our family lives, peace in our national governments. We are still searching for that mysterious integrity which alone can bind up the errors of society. Now, looking back as far as we can in history on this, we observe a certain number of special points of interest, and these include both Eastern and Western thinking. The wisdom of Asia and the wisdom of the Western world combined. And it all seems to sum up in one peculiar inconsistency name that the individual seeks something better without becoming better himself. He seems to think of religion as a way of atoning for something, atoning for his own misdeeds or his own ignorance. He seems to believe that if he can become part of an association of religious peoples, that he can drift with them into the better land beyond. But actually, we are today no closer to that which we essentially seek 
than we were thousands of years ago. Because we have added more to our difficulties than we have to our solutions. And now we all stand in the midst of the greatest challenge we've ever known, nuclear warfare. Now how all of the good of the past could come to this, how the love and wisdom of thousands of dedicated souls uh, could not prevent this emergency is a very strange and sad commentary on our way of life. So this morning we want to take up the problem of opening the doors to the inner self, to the reality within us, to see if we can come to a little better understanding of the problems that we face. Those of you who have, in travel, visited primitive peoples, may note one interesting point, namely way back in the beginning of time, there were those who had visions. There were those who had strange beliefs, but these beliefs were supported by extrasensory perceptions. And in those old days, the great scriptures of the world were written. In those days, the great philosophical and scientific footings were laid down. And we have only inherited the skill to make certain improvements upon original revelations. Therefore, the great period of revelation is not now. The great period of revelation gave the world Pythagoras and Akhenaton and Moses, Zoroaster, Buddha, Krishna, all the great scholars and wisdom teachers of the past. Now, why was that the way it is? Why were those days better for the development of wisdom than ours? I think the prob the, probably the answer to this is reasonably evident, namely, an uncluttered existence. Our ancestors did not have the great ambitions that we have. Even our forebears in this country had no such vast ambitions as we are courting today. In those days, people lived close to nature, which was a great ad advantage. They lived in a simple, natural environment that had not been spoiled completely. True, they lived in company with some un unpleasant animals and things of this nature, and quite early it began to develop uh, feuds among themselves. But generally speaking, primitive man lived in a natural world. And living in a natural world, when he tried to create a philosophy of life with very limited resources to, with which to work, and not really any understanding that there was a philosophy of life, he began to build his way of living by studying the life of the world around him. There is an account, I don't know whether it's uh, completely factual or traditional, to the effect that speech came from nature that long before the individual was able to have words or created alphabets, he copied natural sounds. And having the proper structure in the throat to do so, he was able to imitate the sound of a waterfall or a wind through trees or the cries of birds and animals. And this seemingly was the beginning of language. He found it possible to tell his neighbor or communicate certain ideas, feelings, impulses by accepting the sounds of the natural world. He knew sounds that frightened him and sounds that pleased him. He knew sounds of birth and sounds of death. And from all these he began to develop a series of sounds which became gradually letters of a, prim of a primitive alphabet. But these sounds came definitely from the natural world. So did everything else he had. He had to come to the conclusion that if he was ever going to understand the invisible, he must be able to find it in the visible. Almost all old theologies are merely abstractions of natural phenomena. The gods were the powerful chieftains. All of the rules and laws attributed to deities were the result of human relationships testing the possibility of community existence. 
So little by little, we built a world in which nature provided the only available facts. These facts could be by careful meditation, perhaps, or constant reinvestigation, could become truths. And this, in a sense, is the beginning of modern science in 17th century Europe. Namely, that there were truths that could be built upon facts. That these facts could become the basis of rules. That these facts, by constant repetition and investigation, showed nature's way in a great many directions. It made it possible to decide internally, to a measure at least, what nature expected us to do on the basis of nature would penalize anything that was not within its own approval. So little by little, the science of nature began to take the form of a natural philosophy. A natural philosophy that was based upon the seasons, upon the climates, upon the various nature phenomena, from everything from the gently flowing stream to the volcanic eruption. All these things had to be fitted into something supported by facts. And facts were things that you could see, that you could touch, or you could in some way have a direct contact. Now from facts, the uh, problem of truths resulted in morality. Morality was really the moral interpretation of facts. It was a fact made alive and vivid through experience. The individual taking the fact and working with it discovered finally that it had within itself a meaning, a moral value, that it produced good consequences, that it advanced causes, whereas error nearly always destroyed. So little by little, the truth factor came in. And after a long time uh, with truth, the mind and consciousness began to ascend to a higher level. And this was reality. Reality is, in a sense, the higher octave of truth. It is something that is gradually built into our understanding as a complicated network of truths, working together and through their interaction producing what we call reality. Reality is the final proof of the truth of a fact. And on this basis, we have built most of the learning that we know today. Now, it also follows that from the beginning of time, individuals, in a mysterious way, began to question themselves. The caveman, probably, was among the first to ask why he was created in the first place. The answer has not yet been found. Most people have the slightest idea where they're here. They have no idea where they came from, except biologically, and nowhere near uh, any more from by where they're going, except in terms of the mortuary. All of the rest is a noble internal reaction to something. The individual was not willing to accept the fact alone. He had to build it into a moral value which became his truth, and he finally had to accept it and live it and grow because of it, and that way contact reality. So we're going to now question how the people of today or of long ago continued their search for reality. And what did they use to open the doors between the visible and the invisible? How did they expect to attain a, con a concrete, visual, audible reality? Well, in the earliest days that we know of, there were in all tribes and nations certain mystics. And these mystics were persons who were given to strange dreams visions, curious experiences, which did not limit their consciousness entirely to the common world. Somewhere in the long the line, dreams became a part of man's structure of searching. A dream had certain technical advantages. It, it could be described, it could also be experienced, and it could be, in a sense, fitted into the social pattern. 
A dream might, therefore, pertain to a world or vision or place beyond this life. A vision could be an experience of that which is beyond, a conscious contemplation. Now, of course, for a long time, dreams were considered as if symbolic of mystical values. Dreams were the basis of healing in ancient Greece. Dreams were the basis of social growth among the American Indians. Dreams were always something a little beyond, a little intangible, but sufficiently substantial to be recalled, to be remembered, and to be shared with other people. Now, dreams also gave another proportion to consciousness. Dreams often were centered in some other place than the one that we are familiarly acquainted with. While we lived in our comparative modest dwellings, we had dreams of temples and palaces and shrines and great mountains, hierarchies of celestial beings, and all the mysterious mechanism of Dante's divine comedy. All of these things could be experienced, and we might add, to be practical, they were perhaps best experienced after reading Dante's Divine Comedy, because that type of reading placed certain attitudes or ideas in the subconscious of the human being. And gradually, as intellectualism increased and improved, the individual not only began to downgrade his dreams, but also to change them to meet the changing social conditions of his times. But dreams were a sleep phenomena that has played a part in man's evolution from the very earliest time. Now, there have always been natural mystics. These natural mystics were not necessarily psychics. They had experiences, but these experiences were inward revelations. The true mystic was not telling his neighbor what was going to happen to him. The true mystic was exploring a realm or a vista far greater than the material world in which he lived. Perhaps among the great mystics we should mention Johann Thaler, Jacob Bamey, and Emanuel Swedenborg. These persons came from different areas of life, different levels of culture, but also had similar experiences. Swedenborg was a scientist of high standing, and Bamey was a shoemaker, and Tala was a monk. These different people all had mystical experiences, and these experiences resulted largely from a great longing or a great yearning, or, as in the case of several of them, a great tragedy in their personal lives. They came a time, and there's always a time, when an individual who becomes sorry for himself, perhaps quite legitimately, not simply an emotional state of affairs, but a frustration of the real values of living, that individuals of this type may retire into themselves and live in a world of constructive and idealistic fantasies. But are they fantasies? This is also a question that has never been satisfactorily solved to meet everyone's requirements. But we also know that the mind has become a powerful factor in the effort to make the invisible real to us. And the mind has developed all kinds of experimental processes. The mind has borrowed heavily from outside sources for the information intended to reform the inner life of the person to whom that mind belonged. So the mind almost always builds an invisible upon the visible through a certain intellectual, uh, m m mental approach. And today we have all kinds of such approaches. They are found in practically every religious system of the world and they are opposed by every agnostic system. They have become the basis of moral philosophy and have also resulted, unfortunately, in the rise of a great many competitive institutions. But the mind becoming more and more enmeshed in the obvious or the external, and the external becoming less and less soundly founded, so that it is based today very heavily 
upon mistakes and misfortunes. The mind becomes a dangerous instrument. Now, the mind was not such a dangerous instrument long ago when society was a comparatively simple structure. Probably, really, the mind's domination of the situation began with the dawn of ambition. And when uh, ambition reached a certain degree where it was willing to accomplish its end by destructive, by destructive means, then ambition became a mental liability. And we have several such liabilities today in which the mind is really no longer capable of direct thinking. It is no longer capable of truth-seeking in the real sense of the word. The term truth has come into bad times and has now been applied to so many different mistakes that it is practically impossible to classify them. But the fact seemingly remains that the mind, which might possibly have opened the doors to the internal, has only become another gatekeeper, preventing us from entering. The mind, therefore, guards the gate of the superior as a watchman uh, to be, make sure that the individual does not outgrow the level of thinking which is common to his society. It is assumed that, assumed that if he does this, he will be an outlaw, impoverished, and probably disgraced. So the, God, the mind guards his outer reputation at the expense of his inner life. Now with this problem more or less uh, obvious, what have we left as ways of finding the inner? Well, the second way, perhaps, is religion, as expressed through the heart doctrines of many people. Most people who will follow the heart doctrine, basically, are not intellectuals primarily. They may have excellent minds, they may know everything that a true intellectual does know, but they also have something else. They have a dimension of sympathy, a, dim a dimension of compassion, and they also have a deep-rooted belief and feeling that somewhere in the great pattern of things, an infinite love is moving the universe. These emotional-centered people, therefore, very often come closer to the reality uh, than the intellectual. In emotion, you have experiences, sometimes disillusionments, sometimes discouragements, sometimes destructive reactions, hatreds, and so on. But basically, the heart doctrine is one based upon the teachings of Jesus or one of the other great benevolent world teachers. It is based on the assumption that the search for the reality of things is the primary purpose of my human beings and to live together in a fraternity based upon the realization of reality is the solution to the social dilemma. So the heart doctrine has had many exponents and many of them have had I think a greater benevolent influence on mankind than almost any other level of instruction. The person who is in friendship and in love and affection some way seems to live on and live on in the virtues and achievements of himself through his descendants. It is therefore a very important point to make sure that we realize the tremendous significance of religious affections. But now comes the rub. Mm -hmm. The religious reflections run into, contro into controversy. The individual wishing to be a devout person may find that devotion today is strangely altered. That the simple affair of doing good, of being kind, of being unselfish, these things are no longer really available in terms of affection. The individual has been cheated too often, he has been imposed upon, and he has also developed ulterior motives within himself that are so powerful that he is really incapable of a pure emotion. He cannot prevent his emotions by being colored, or he cannot reconcile the inconsistency between a noble emotion and an ignoble action. So both exist together in the same person, 
and this conflict results in a loss of man's affection as a means of liberation. Now another type of thing, we go down to a lower problem again, but one that's very distinctive, and that is social relationships. The humanitarian, the individual who lives to help the underprivileged, the benevolent person, the person who devotes his life to the service of mankind in one kind of way or another, the devout physician, the devout attorney, the devout industrialist, the individual who basically is unselfish, uh, becomes a servant to physical needs of human beings and also becomes an inspiration to their internal requirements. These all four constitute a level of virtue in which the person becomes virtuous through service. And service is, of course, in fact, and in vision and in substance, the noblest expression of man's inner life. But the inner life itself must still be considered. We must try to find out what happens to help the individual to have an inward experience that is great enough to dominate his mental, emotional, and physical attributes and in that way give him back to the leadership of the best of himself. Plato said that a country is best ruled when the best persons rule. The uh, human being is best governed when the best part of himself leads. Now some think the mind is the best part, others the emotion, some the physical body itself with its resources. But all of these finally come under the leadership of that which dwells within the body, within the emotions, behind the mind. What is this basis of reality? How are we going to reach it? How are we going to challenge it to come out of its strange aloofness so that it can become available to the person? One thing we find out immediately is that this search has to be personal. There is no possibility of communicating this reality in ways necessary to solve the problem of the individual, except that it be given to the individual with his particular problem. So we have to try to find out how uh, to reach the opening of the inner life so that something superior to mind can become the ruler of mind and use the mind, the emotions, and the body as an instrument for the fulfillment of a sacred purpose. This we have to try to discover in one way or another. We begin with it and we begin to see that in ancient times there were various doctrines that were developed very largely for the purpose of bringing the individual into contact with his own higher nature. That there were teachings that taught him to rise above the, even the highest aspects of his own mind into an immediate and intimate experience of reality. This became a very deep and important problem, particularly with the Neoplatonists and uh, with the Buddhists and several other groups that the quest for the way to become enlightened. Enlightenment being in this case the light of the inner shining upon the outer. It was not the individual holding a candle up before his own mind. It had to be something else. The light had to be something that came from above and not through him as a person. It had to be a blessing, a benediction, a baptism of the Spirit. And he had to try to find if there was any way in the world in which it could happen to him. And most of those who have achieved greatly believe that it could happen. And those whose recorded remarks and opinions on the subject have descended to us. While they do not tell us the way, tell us the way they developed and maybe gave us a clue to what we could do in our own time and in our own way. One of the first things that we are told in ancient scriptures is the simple line, Be still and know that I am God. Now I think perhaps this is one of the most important statements in connection with man's religious life. The problem of trying to be still. 
Now, when we think of still, if we are bound to material things, we will simply say that the individual does nothing. That is not the answer. That is not what is intended. Intended only to become part of worship. When the individual seeks the ordinary, he can read a school book or attend a class. When he seeks to know the mystery of his own inner self, he cannot storm the gates of heaven. If he tries to get into the sheepfold, which was the old name for religion, by any way except the proper gate, he is then a thief and a robber. Therefore, the ethics, the morality, the integrities involved have to be kept in mind at all times. To be still to the mystic means to be free from the involvements of mind and emotion and free also from various physical symptomologies that may arise in order that he will be permit that which is truly the over-self to be heard. The still voice, the small voice, comes to the individual who stops talking long enough to hear it. And that is very rare even in religion. The problem always is that we are trying desperately to decide for ourselves on mental, emotional, and physical levels those problems and decisions which can come only from something superior to what we now use. We have to some way break into that mysterious realm that has been called intuition or the extrasensory band. Now we have to be careful even of this because the ex extrasensory band has now become locked in the intellectual pattern. The extrasensory perception now is merely to explore scientifically those parts of the universe which might be usable here, but which we are not aware of at the present time. Therefore, extrasensory perception may be completely selfish, may be intended to advance destruction, may be engaged in in order to find new uh, weapons and new ways of avoiding truth. These things can come from the wrong understanding of what is intended by the concept of be still and know. To be still now for us in this particular world in which we now live, it seems to me is to cease doing that which is not necessary, not right, and not good. The individual must choose sometime to clearly face the fact that he cannot be right if he continues to act wrong that there is a, a relationship between conduct and consciousness. There is a relationship between our material personality and that mysterious locked over self which we are seeking to understand. Therefore, it is very necessary to be still in the sense of recovering from all of those intemperances of attitudes by means of which the normal growth of the consciousness is delayed or, di or disposed of entirely. Therefore, if we want to really understand this, we have to begin the process of ironing out ourselves to get rid of those things which interfere with the natural mistakes of life. I mentioned that one day to a man who came to me that if he stopped all these various attitudes that he had, he'd be better off. And he seemed quite unhappy and a little indignant. Well, he said, if I stop thinking about all these mistakes, I'll have nothing at all to think about. <laughs> well, that probably is true. But it is possible to imagine that there might be some things to think about that are not mistakes, if we give any ground for such thinking. If we are willing to gradually iron out the imp impulses and intemperances with which we have burdened ourselves for thousands of years and brought with us in any sequence of rebirths that happens to us. Supposing we say that uh, the individual who wants to get better is trying to grow because the present condition has become intolerable. The person is not satisfied as he is. 
he is not satisfied in what he has been. But he does not know how to carry himself into the future without dragging this rubble with him. His tomorrow is just another day in which to worry about the problems of yesterday. This whole problem of the cont continuity of a compound attitude has to be broken up in some way. The person has to be able to be quiet without unhappy thoughts coming. He must be able to be relaxed and think without thinking destructively, critically, or in some way detrimental to all concerned. And if his thinking is so bad he can't stand it, he has got to learn to get over the instinct to take a drink or something and forget himself. The individual trying to forget himself is really telling us he's trying to forget a personality that is impossible. And there is no way of getting away with it except by outgrowing it. Now, some have undoubtedly have been able to drink themselves to death and hope that by this means that they have accomplished everything that was necessary. While these people, these people belong in the, believe in the, in the kind of life that we are generally living, they will feel they have got release. But to the deeper thinker, they have solved nothing and have escaped nothing. So that the problem becomes again, cure it now rather than face it later. So in the problem of getting started on this inner search, we have to try to find out that nature in its own way, our natural compound is essentially cooperative. The body with all its natural functions is really a pretty good creature considering everything. It has laws and rules which if we keep them, it will keep us as long as possible. It also has rules that we cannot break. And the moment we begin to reject our responsibility to the body, we're in trouble. We get so interested in what we're doing mentally and emotionally that we wreck the body. And because we have wrecked the body in accomplishing a large personal fortune, we then feel that the wreckage was worthwhile, but it isn't. Actually, therefore, the first laws that man faces are obvious to himself. He faces them in his daily living, but he has learned to carefully ignore the findings. He also has developed a new escape, which our ancestors really didn't have, namely that if he couldn't get out of the trouble himself, he could hire someone else to get out of it for him. But it's just as difficult to have another person solve your problems as to have another person eat your food and you be nourished by it. You can't do these things. So we have now the complex situation of people who want to grow, but have already stunted their own growth badly. They want to be better, but they do not know what to do with the mistakes that have accumulated. I think the old mystics had the perfect answer for it. They simply said, be quiet and know that I am God. Now this wasn't a theological type of definition. It is a definition based upon the concept that when we cease to build our own mistakes, when we cease to fashion a giant monster out of our own intemperances and relax, all of these evil things simply fade away for lack of nutrition. But they will not fade as long as one drop of nutriment is available to them. As long as we continue to have unhappy attitudes, we are not going to solve the mystery of our own inner consciousness. Actually, the way of life physically that gives us the maximum probability for years is the same type of discipline as that which is necessary to the mind and the emotions so that they will fulfill their duties as perfectly as possible. When the emotions are quieted down to simple, gentle, real values, the emotional nature is protected. We have no likelihood of trouble with some of the internal organs of uh, the endocrine system, which have particular control over our emotional content. We will not kill ourselves by false feelings any more 
then we will kill ourselves with bad food. When we go up again uh, to the third one, we have the mind. If the mind is used as it was intended to be used, and that is for the common good, for the advancement of everything that is real and valuable in life. If the mind could be released from the terrific pressure of self-interest, if it could get away from all its scheming on how to defeat a brother, and rather simply, quietly work out how to help him, all things would be much better in the mental world, there would be much less mental breakdown, and we would not be suffering from too many cases of senility. It is the misuse of the mind that gradually changes life into a dismal uh, uh, dwelling for the individual. So in each of these levels there is a natural law. Each of these creatures has its rights and privileges. Each level of ourselves has its inalienable needs and corrections. They're all here if we want to use them. Now a lot of people have uh, been perfectly willing to support religions industriously. They have been willing to make pilgrimage. They have been willing to do all kinds of penances uh, to remove some guilt mechanisms within themselves. And uh, at the same time, even though they live a pretty fair life, this great experience of, of projection into something higher has not occurred to them. And largely, it's a result of not being able to quiet the separate levels of our consciousness on their own levels and then quiet the relationships of them to each other. In other words, if the mind and emotions are locked in conflict, they're in trouble. Wherever there is conflict, there is a kind of destruction. There is a false motion. Wherever there is an obstruction, there is a decay of values, a disintegration, an infection in which something becomes sick. All selfishness is sickness, no matter what you want to call it. All jealousy is sickness. These things are just exactly as serious as sicknesses as are the ordinary physical ailments which we may or may not be able to cure. This problem, therefore, is to get rid of the sickness arising from the misuse of powers, faculties, and principles within ourselves. Unless we're able to do this, we're going to stay right in trouble just the way we are. But the worst part of it is, we may be a good church member while we're in this problem. It has never occurred to us that religion demanded anything more of us than allegiance. It was like a parent who demanded that the child obey, but did not necessarily uh, contribute to any enlightenment in the purposes of obedience. The, uh, the religious association, which washes away sins with baptismal water, has not gotten to the point where it realizes, or bad people realize, that they have got to wash their own sins away all too often with their own tears. So there is time to get at some of these values directly. If the person wants to be born again in the theological sense of the word, it isn't that he simply accepts a religion. To be born again means to not make the same mistakes again. It means to clear the slate. A new birth means to start out with a fresh, clean, honest mind without carrying anything from the past that was destructive or against the Ten Commandments or against the Sermon on the Mount. Everything that is detrimental must be left aside. It must not be carried forward. Yet the individual uh, may be born again and still be in some business which is highly competitive or in a family relationship in which tyranny dominates or children are neglected or the older members of the family are ignored. All of these things are not assumed to interfere with being born again. But to be born again with them is to be just the same as you were before. Instead of a new birth, it's just a new name for the same old things that you always problemed. Now, out of this, there's something more, though, than just keeping the morality straight. 
It is part of this business of being quiet. Every agitation, every intensity of negative attitude is dangerous to the inner life of the person. Therefore, we say that when we want the individual to be still and know, Therefore, we say that when we want the individual to be still and know, we want the individual to change his entire basic uh, formula for life. It doesn't mean he can't speak. It doesn't mean he can't have ideas. But he has to have only things that work together for good. The body, mind, emotions must be brought into harmonic relationships. There must be no discords in the compound of the person. It doesn't mean he necessarily is awfully well advanced. He isn't perfect. He isn't above making an occasional mistake. But when he makes a mistake, he knows it and he's sorry. And when he's not too wise, he may be much deeper in the mysteries of his own inner life. So the problem is that in stillness now is the end of conflict, not the end of function. It is that no longer will the individual be in a continuous disturbance with himself. He will not regret, he what, regret what he did yesterday and build a new regret today. Pythagoras advised this doctrine of recollections to, uh, to accomplish freedom from habit patterns. He advised his disciples that every day they should live their lives over again backward for that day. See what they did right and what they did wrong, and determine to correct any mistake during that was made during that day. Recognize it, correct it, and outgrow it, and reach the condition in which it would not be repeated. So what we're asking for, really, is a good-natured person of kindly disposition who has managed to get over griefs and grievances who is able to live in pleasant relationships with other people, who is not jealous, who does not tear down reputations, and doesn't lock in feuds with anybody, who holds no violent dislikes over subjects they do not understand, do not take sides on problems they do not know. But whatever happens, remain open and ever watching for the good and watching and rewarding only the best of their own conduct. This means a more or less simple life. One way that the medievals found to gain this simple life was by joining the clergy. They became monks, lived in monasteries, God worked in gardens, spent most of their time in prayer and meditation. But this didn't work quite well either, for in this case, the isolation was the individual arming himself against himself. He was determined to destroy the opportunities to make mistakes and gain virtue in that way. It's not done that way. It doesn't work. The individual does not recover uh, from his mistakes because he locks himself away from temptation. Because temptation is still there and all kinds of internal pressures uh, affect him and afflict him even while he is in a monastic existence. The, an the answer to the whole thing was stay in the world but be able to live your own inner life without worry and fear and if other people wish to ridicule it, let them. But do not resent their ridicule. It's not worth it. Do that which your inner life tells you is right. And in order to do that, you have to get a message. Now, messages coming from the inner life are often mistaken. Very often, what we consider to be a vision is merely a way of supporting our own personal attitudes. When visions begin to support our right to be wrong, we have a good reason to question the visions. Visions can be nothing but nightmares, 
They can be nothing but psychological expressions of our own defects. They can reveal to a clinical uh, trained psychiatrist or psychologist just what is wrong with our dispositions and why we are in trouble. This type of vision or dream is of no basic value except as a warning. And the individual does not need to uh, have an elaborate uh, analysis of this. For if he has pressures, he will have dreams. And most of the dreams will be related to his pressures, either justifying them or trying to help him uh, to fulfill the things that have created the pressures. So we don't go on that level. But if there are no pressures, if there are no intensities, if the individual is living a very quiet, reasonable, and natural life, perhaps it'll be a little like Jacob Bernie, the great German mystic. He was raised and educated as a shoemaker. He was an apprentice shoemaker. Finally, we got his papers and became a master shoemaker and lived in the little town of Gerlitz all his life. He was married and had children. He attended the Lutheran church and he was a very simple person with only the education possible from a local school which probably taught him only enough to read the Bible. So this man quietly, peacefully made a strange compact with himself. He resolved to live as best he could in his simple way the best he knew. And he was a very quiet man and a very charitable man. And when the Lutheran communion turned against him very bitter, he never for one moment showed the slightest resentment. While they were denouncing him in the church, he was sitting in his pew and listening to it. He was unwilling to even uh, pick a quarrel with the men who were accusing him of heresy. Fortunately, at that time, the Inquisition was not in control in Germany, so he, the, all they could do was downgrade him. But actually, in this very simple family way, they say a very wonderful father, a faithful husband, a good friend, and an absolutely honest craftsman who marked every shoe he made and guaranteed it. To this simple man came some of the most extraordinary visions recorded in history. One day, while he was working in his shop, he had to, a chance to look up and he saw a ray of light striking a pewter plate on the wall. This ray of light struck him in the eyes, and in that moment he had a vision of another world. And this vision he had of another world had none of the peculiarities that we associate with sectarianism. It was a world which he had not even a terminology for. He borrowed all kinds of words from his friends and neighbors because he had no words. He also uh, was able to gain some terminology from alchemy and astrology and other subjects, but he used them always in his own way, not the way they were originally being used in the communities. Little by little, Vemi discovered in himself a strange and wonderful truth that was the basis of all his thinking and all his living. He said that in the very beginning there was nothing in the universe but peace. That this peace reached everywhere and everyone was in peace with everyone else. And they talked to God and God answered them in the voice of a small child, a very gentle child, not much older than themselves, because he was speaking to common people and not to great scholars. And they were all peaceful until along came Lucifer. And Lucifer was self-will, and by self-will fell the angels. And when uh, Lucifer uh, asked deity for certain privileges, he was a faithful cherub at that time, God spoke again in the voice of the little child and said what was necessary. And Lucifer said, oh no, I don't like this. Uh, I don't want to, have to live in a universe that is ruled by a small child. 
and if the deity can't speak out the great and glorious words I want to hear, I'm going to take over the job. Remember, this is a low Dutch in Germany. Uh, so he uh, said, I'm going to take over. I'm going to run the universe now. So he challenged deity and said, I'm not going to do these things. If you're just a puny little deity living in space without anything around you except a baby voice, I'm going to show you how to run this thing. And at the moment that he said that was the moment of the great disobedience. And in an instant, the heavens completely changed. Everything changed. The sky was filled with great spiritual powers. In the midst of them was uh, seated or placed the ineffable deity with all power, all splendor, all skills and the thunder and rumbling voice that could be heard everywhere. And it is thus that the pride of Lucifer opened the abyss of the self, opened the world of sorrow and pain because he had tried to take over the management of the universe and because he could see no God until he disobeyed and then the whole glory of heaven broke upon him. Now there's something about this it's an almost a, a beautiful myth or legend that can be carried right on down. For the man taking over the universe because God didn't seem big enough to handle the job is something that we all might think about occasionally. Also in all the problems that we have, when we think of the universal divine plan as too weak to handle us, to take care of our problems, so that we have to suddenly become helpers in this deal, we may get into serious trouble. But Baby was essentially a great mystic, and he pointed out that when the human being becomes aware of the realities and uses them properly, the, the great grief or the great sorrow fades away again, and man and God live together in infinite community, always man obeying that which was eternally ordained to be obeyed. So in this way, Mamie had his statement of silence, of peace that was disrupted by the rise of human faults, human emergencies, and the forever human uh, optimism and complacency. So that uh, to, to be still is to know the universe as stillness. To be still is to hear the voice of God in the voice of a small child. To disobey is to bring down upon oneself the thunder of an absolutely immutable power. To obey, we do not know there are laws. When we break them, we discover to our sorrow that we have not been very wise. So we're going to try to think in terms of a quietude that is free from ulterior motive. And this was what Zen attempted to do in India. And this is what Taoism attempted to do in China. This also is the mystery of Neoplatonism and the ideals of Pythagoras. It was the idea that man only comes into trouble when he does it wrong. As long as he is right, he doesn't know there are any laws. Because by keeping them perfectly, everything is serene and well-balanced. But the moment self-interest takes over, the power of the abyss is loosened upon us. So we think now of quietude as just quietly doing the things that are right, peacefully doing the things that must be done in peace, and performing all good deeds in the name of the one sovereign good upon which we all depend, and from which we must gain all our life and resource. Now, the mystics have found out that if we live this quiet inner life, that we can carry every responsibility of the outer life with dignity. There is no need for us to go around depriving ourselves of everything 
we only have to deprive ourselves of those things which were never any good for us in the first place. We only have to get over what was wrong. We are never punished for what is right. But if we get these things into a quietude and peacefulness, then this achieved condition is the opener of the door. This is the power that makes possible for us the actual direct participation in reality. It is that power which comes to us when we do not interfere or condition that power. When we keep it and keep its principles in integrity and in right, we are like what the Chinese sage has said, that in the ancient days the wise slept without dreams. There was no dreaming about mistakes or therapeutic dreams. There is simply a great quietude. And in this quietude, a perfect peace, the heavens open, and the reality affirms itself in our lives. The uh, story of the uh, fable of Christ knocking at the door is much in this in, uh, thoughtfulness. That which is real knocks at the door when we listen. But when we do all the talking ourselves, the, we cannot hear the gentle voice of truth or, the, or note the gentle knocking on the door. It is in peace and quietude alone that we can open the doors. If it opens the doors means that we make ourselves receptive to a higher level of consciousness. We make ourselves receptive to the experiences of the inner life. We have a victory of, the, of soul over circumstance. We have a, victim, a victory of reality in ourselves over the errors and illusions of daily living. As a result, we are in peace. We are quiet. Now, in the old initiation rites, we were usually subject to very sore, serious tragedies. In the ancient mystery rituals, the candidate was given very firm and terrible tests. There were even de degrees in which his life itself might be hazarded, unless he was right. And in, the, in all these things, he had to fulfill the great tests of life. He had to recapitulate his own existence and go through a series of harrowing circumstances which would result finally in his attainment of oneness with the inner consciousness. Well, maybe today we're still taking the same rituals. We don't call them rituals anymore. We call them mistakes of other people or inabilities of governors to govern, inability to the governed to govern himself. All these things we now call blames. Probably they are actually tests, experiences which will never cease until we stop making the mistakes that cause the trouble. There will never be a time when social legislation can prevent the individual from making a mistake. And we can never have perfect leadership until we have an intelligent following. There must be dedicated followers and enlightened leaders. And in every case, the enlightenment means self-victory, the victory of the inner life over the outer circumstances, the outer temptations, the outer beliefs, the outer circumstances which lead to trouble. So the um, Buddhists and the Zen people, for instance, have a very quiet method of meditation. They sit quietly and they simply allow not a blank to set in. The idea is not to make the mind a blank. The idea is to make the mind a gentle disciple at the kneeling or seated at the foot of the reality within. The human becomes the trailer of the divine, becomes the disciple of that which must always be the leader. And various ways these revelations come to people. Sometimes they may come in an occasional dream, which is a vision, or a real spiritual experience, which is comparatively rare. But all spiritual experiences must be doubted that the individual who has them has not conquered the common mistakes of himself. 
anyone who believes an extrasensory experience who is still incapable of the, the direct control of his own life constructively must be afraid of imposture. And any organization that promises the individual that he can become great without becoming good is also a very dubious organization. There can be no rising upward into the higher levels of consciousness except through a kind of meditative discipline. And what is meditation in this case? It is not sitting in a corner somewhere uh, with your eyes closed and your fists ch clenched tightly. Meditation in this case is the quiet recognition, realization of the values of life as they have been presented to us in daily experience. Meditation helps to bring us a new way of it being useful, a new way of solving or helping to solve problems around us. Now we can say with all meditation practices that nobody can solve anybody else's problems. This is true. Therefore, the fact that we think we are solving them is not quite really true. The part that is beneficial to us is the fact that we have given up something of ourselves because we love someone else more. This is the great gift. And the great gift in turn going to them uh, give, may give them the courage to see what we have done and do it for themselves. Every individual who becomes happy must make himself happy. There is no possible way of other people making anyone really happy. And any apparent happiness that arises without the con control and direction of inner faculties is going to come on the rocks one of these days and be seriously shipwrecked. All these things are part of a large plan, a large purpose, a divine way of things. And uh, in our quietude, in the small voice, the voice of the silence will speak. And the voice will be like the voice of God in, in Bami's vision. It will be a small, quiet voice, never a thundering of power, never a vast expression of some determination, never a final order descending from on high. But it will be the quiet voice of a gentle person uh, telling us something we ought to know and telling it as though we were beloved children and not because we were great people. The, the recognition of these experiences comes often in various small ways. I know, for instance, one case in which an individual was very fond of a garden. They loved to plant flowers and things of that nature. And they always loved flowers. It was a very kindly relationship. It was a beautiful, quiet relationship. And one day this person while looking at one of the flowers that was particularly beautiful, had something happen. Suddenly, this flower seemed to speak. It didn't say anything, but it seemed to speak, and suddenly the law of that flower burst into the mind of this very kindly gardener. It, the law of the flower became a symbol of the whole unfolding of the cosmos. The flower became a, an infinite symbol of an infinite purpose. And it is. It is a part of a great and infinite purpose. But most of those who look at the flower don't see it that way. But this person saw it that way. Saw the flower as suddenly bursting forth into a perfect symbolism of the universe. It was there all, all the time, but at that moment, the reality in the individual picked it up and brought it out. The message came from something beyond the mind, something beyond the emotions, but an infinite impression of reality, which meant that the person had for a moment's contact with one of these levels of higher insight. Plotinus, the Neoplatonist, said that it, in his lifetime that only on two occasions had he been lifted up into the presence of reality, and that for only a few seconds. But that became the most powerful experience of life. And all of life from then on was never the same as it had been before. The same might be said too of Luther Burbank with his love of flowers and plants. Here's a man who was able, very obviously, to influence flowers and plants. 
I saw him one afternoon and we talked about these things and he said that he could talk with the plants and the plants answered him. And when he said he wanted them to do something, they did it. So several big universities sent classes and students and so forth to see how Mr. Burbank was taking the spines off of cactus so they could be used in the desert to feed cattle. Uh, and uh, they did exactly what he did and got nowhere. And he explained that the reason they didn't get the result was because they hadn't talked to the flowers and plants. They hadn't told those plants what he wanted them to do what they should do and how they could help by doing it. But if you talk with them and understand them, even in silence, you commune with them, not as little things with a root, but as reality and bound up in a magnificent little mystery, that they, they obey. And he told me, he said, the only person I ever had that was able to do it was an old Chinese gardener. He said, this gardener watched me and listened. And from that time on, he always talked to the plants. And they did what he wanted them to also. He said, you've got to understand life. Life is not you and nothing, or you and something that doesn't mean anything. And all the flowers and birds and animals and creatures of the universe are, are real. And to each level of man's thinking, some form of life becomes immediately instructive. And by accepting the instruction, a great new dimension of consciousness is achieved. This is the only way reality can be proven. It can't be proven in laboratories. It can't be proven in anything except all of nature. The very planet and everything that is on it bears absolute and eternal witness to reality. But the reality is not obvious to the person who doesn't know what the term means or doesn't know what the experience of it means. To us, humanity is a unique thing. Other things are different. We're now beginning to take a little interest in animal life, but at the same time, the, we haven't found the realities in these things. We haven't found that by looking at the most simple living thing that we, become, we come face to face with a truth, a, a reality, an inevitable, which we can never influence but which we can learn to accept and obey. So this is what really opening the door is. This is why the Indian went out and did vigil. He did vigil because he knew that the air was filled with life. He knew that everything that existed was real. Now he couldn't come back and explain all this to his uh, fellow tribesmen, although most of them probably were sympathetic to it, but the proof of the fact was something else. The proof was that when he went out as a healer and sat in dead vigil, the, the, true, the great ones, the true ones, sent symbols to him so that he would know what to do. And the and Kwa, when he was up here with me, he said that a little light appeared somewhere on the earth around him, around a little plant or a little flower or a weed or even some little small animal or creature. And he knew instantly that that which the light was around was the thing that was necessary to heal the sick man for whom he was praying. So he took this material, usually an herb, which he had never used before. He had no botanical knowledge, but he had seen in a meditation that this was it. And he took it and he made a tea with it and he gave it to the sick man. Then the reality proved itself. The man got well. That was the only reality that could be demonstrated. All the others could be, it may be a mistake, but if the man got well by a mystical experience, then that experience was real. And it's the same all the way along. We cannot get the positive demonstrations that we seek of all these things. The only thing we know is that the closer we can come to reality, the closer we come to peace, happiness, and health. And the further we get from reality, the more rapidly our problems multiply. Now, for those of us who are just, you know, kind of going along on the way and haven't got too far, there are things we can do ourselves each day. We can begin to quiet the prominent causes of confusion. 
There is no meditation based upon some esoteric exercise that can ever work if the individual has not accomplished a transformation within himself. This was the highest phase of alchemy. Alchemy was to make gold out of base metals. And uh, the spiritual alchemy was to discover the eternal gold of reality in all things, which can be released and brought into manifestation by art. And art in this case is the beauty. It is the skill. It is the wonder by which we do what is right because it is right. This type of thing is something that has come down to us for a long, long time. And it will continue to come down to us until we obey it. We must find the only answer that there is, and that is the utopian answer, that the human being must live the fullness of humanity, of his own endowment. He must manifest all the manifestations of the condition of the level of life upon which he exists. And then, having done this, he may then request very quietly, or may not even have to request, because reality is perpetuate themselves. We expect to go on to the next level of understanding and insight. We are held behind by the ballast of our own mistakes. And until we are able to master those and redeem them or restore the integrities in them, we will remain in trouble. So the first thing to do, if you're really anxious to get on to the discipleship principle in nature, is to start in and prove worthiness. Prove as the ancients did in the initiation tests. When a uh, disciple wanted to enter into the mysteries of Eleusis in Greece, the first thing that was done was uh, that his community was invited. The, the archon, a leader of the community, was invited to tell what they thought of this young person whether he was a good person, whether he was a good son or a daughter, because women were initiated. Uh, but uh, were they, was this person a good, worthy, honorable person? And if the city father said yes, and that he had never been in trouble, that he'd always been a good member of the community, that was a good mark for the, for the person. If he was, had been troublesome, he would never have been admitted any further. Then, if uh, they, that was true, they then went to his teacher. Where did this young person study, and what did he study? So they found the master, an old sophist of some kind, who had instructed him. And they said, was he a good student? Yes. Uh, was he quick-minded and able to understand? Yes. Well, what did he give him to study? Mathematics, astronomy, and music. And that is correct then they would probably call the boy to be given the examinations at the temple itself. And if he passed these successfully, he was placed on a five-year probation ship in which it was assumed that he would take the hope of going on as the basis of a great improvement in himself. He was to go to back to his ordinary life and do those things which he believed would be sanctioned, justified, and approved by the temple. He had to be virt uh, virtuous and, cure and clean and healthy all through this five-year period. He must have no trace of egotism. He must not look down on others who had been rejected. He must simply live a clean, natural, honorable life, serving his family, keeping the rules of the community, and developing his own inner life. At the end of that time, he was put into the test. And these tests were very severe on many occasions. But they were tests of every courage that the individual had. And every opportunity was given to be corrupted or to be sidetracked. But if he succeeded and lived on and was able to pass the final test, he was brought forth from the porch of the temple and crowned with the laurel wreath and declared to be an official and recognized member of the religious group. This then became be something that was so important that in the presence of an initiate of the mysteries, even the king of the country could not remain seated. The uh, divine instruction took precedence over all material honors. 
and the initiation was more important than to win a great military victory or to attain to be an archon of the state or to become a leader in any external affair. He might win the Olympic Games ten times, but it was not nearly as much of an honor as to have the wreath of the initiate placed upon him. From that time, he was bound by oaths greater than himself that he would never corrupt, never compromise, never in any way abuse, and never falsely reveal to the unworthy the instruction he had received and would never use that instruction for personal physical gain. Now those were pretty rough instructions, but at the same time, they are the type of thing that we must all ultimately face. Fortunately, we don't face it all at once. We don't have to do all that is right at one time. But little by little, day by day, we are supposed to discipline our mistakes, gradually gaining control over them, correcting attitudes that are not conducive to common good. And in this way, by a certain regular order of things, come finally to the point where the interior takes complete control of the exterior and the individual lives from the root of his own reality, that he is now no longer a person. He is now a great soul in, the, in a body. He is an illuminate. He has achieved the end that the physical world can bestow. And he has now available to him all the knowledge of his race, all the wisdom of nature around him, and all the love of the deity whom he represents and who brought him forth. So these are the things that open the gates, the gates of integrities, and these are the only ways that the gates of wisdom can truly be opened. And I've got a little announcement I want to make this morning. We have with us a friend who had a birthday last Monday, but we didn't speak Sunday, so this is the first chance we've had. And that is our good friend, Gilbert Olson. Well, many of you know. And Gilbert Olson... Uh, has been a personal friend of mine for 45 years and has served us here ever since the society was built practically. And we, today we kind of give him a little note of welcome and appreciation on a, a little belated birthday party for him. It's not going to be a real party, but it's going to be a chance for those of you who know him to congratulate him on having made it and also to, t uh, to point out that a big change has come in Gilbert's life. He has left Downey, where he lived for very many years, and he's now moving to Glendale in order that he can be over here more often. So we want you to all say hello for him. <laughs> 